Well, good morning, everybody. So good to see you. Welcome to St. Andrews, whether this is your first time here or your hundredth time here or maybe your first time in a while, you are in the right place this morning. Let's stand together and let's worship the Lord. We're here, let's sing that again. The name of
going through. Let's sing this out like we believe it. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Yeah. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can... See, it's kind of a rhetorical question because the answer is nobody.
Rising sun to the setting same I praise your name Great is your faithfulness to me Amen Please enjoy a seat and I invite you to join me in a responsive reading that is our prayer of confession today. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. For in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. For God demonstrates his love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For this is love, not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for us. And God raised us up with Christ in order that he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. Therefore, forgive as the Lord forgave you. For the Lord is forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to him. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Loving and forgiving God, Lord, we do come before you today, offering our hearts and our minds for your redeeming power. And Lord, we admit that there are ways in which we have fallen short. We admit that there are times when we'd like to do our way better than your way, and so that's what we choose. There are times, Lord, when we say something that probably shouldn't have been said or we didn't say something that should have been said and Lord we confess to you we admit that there are times that we know there's a better way and we don't choose it and sometimes there are habits that we have or attitudes that are just kind of we're stuck in and so, Lord, help us get unstuck. Help us to hold the things of this world loosely, what others say about us, how others perceive us, how we feel we need to appear, but rather that we could be your children that are free from that. And so, Lord, help us to see these sins that we commit not as things that you're waiting to call us out on or point your finger, shake your finger at us, but rather these are the things that keep us separate from you, that keep us separate from each other, and that your intention for us is to, to be close to you and to be close to others. And so in our time of confession, we're saying these are the things that we admit keep us separate. And Lord, as we do call to mind these things and admit them and confess them, we also really pray that beyond this forgiveness that is so beautifully lavished upon us, that we're also, through your spirit, given the power to amend our ways, to, to leave this time of prayer feeling that there is a better way, there is another way to live that walking in your ways brings with it such beauty and freedom and joy, peace. And so, Lord, may you transform us. May we be open to how you're creating us more and more into the men and women that you've designed us to be. And so, Lord, may we receive that. May we feel your presence and your power and more so your love, your steadfast love, which never abandons us and allows us to give love to others. And so, Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we love you in Christ's name. Amen. Well, friends, after this time of confession, we are reminded that we are forgiven. Hear these words, in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he has lavished on us. So hear and receive the good news of Jesus Christ. In him we are chosen, set free, and loved. We are forgiven, and this is good news for us.
Amen. Hey, okay, I work with kids. We can do this a little better. Good morning, everyone. All right, I'm so excited to be here. We are going to present our third grade Bible class to you guys today, which we are so excited about. We have third, fourth, and fifth graders who went through our third grade Bible um, class this year at St. Andrews. It's in a beloved, incredible tradition here. So some of you might be wondering, what is third grade Bible? So in third grade Bible, they learn about what their Bible is, how do they use it, what does it mean? They also go through the Old and New Testament. And at the end also, they learn how their story fits into the big story that God has for them. We also talked about Jesus' salvation and um, baptism, which is really fun. We had 30 kids this year go through our third grade Bible program. But woohoo! which is incredible. So this is between our Sunday school kids and also our watch after school program. Um, and one thing I wanna highlight, which is really cool, in our watch after school program, a lot of these kids are unchurched um, and we just get to share the love of Jesus with them and six of them accepted Christ into their hearts at the end of our third grade Bible. So, very incredible things. There are a couple of people I want to point out because this year, for the first time, we had some junior leaders come back to help us teach the third grade Bible program. So these are kids who have already gone through third grade Bible, received their Bibles, and came back, helped us teach, got all of the coloring pencils together, the Play-Doh. They were table leaders with the kids and poured back into them. So I'm going to highlight them just so you guys can see them. So first, we have Ben Bruffy right here. We have Ryan Bustamante. We have Gavin Anderson. We have Owen Yowd. Sam Murphy. And Miss Blake Bars. So, so incredible to have them come back and be a part of this. And now is the fun part. We're going to present our kids with their Bibles. So we are going to start on the far side over here. We have Davis Jubitz. Feel free to clap in between. Charlotte Smith. <laughs> Sierra Buford. Bethany Wolf. Lucas Appel, Jack Toller, Duke Solomon, Graham Jubitz, Cooper Smith, London Story, Braden Bruffy. All right. Uh, we're going to continue right here with Grayson White. <laughs> Callie Bars. Miller McKerney. Angelina Woods. And Haley Bethel. And Rowan Constance. Can we have a big round of applause for our third grade Bible class? So good. Hey, I love this, what we're doing here as a church, planting the word of God deep into the heart of kids at an early age. Some of you went through this, right? You got your Bible here at St. Andrews. I see a couple of those hands, and I'm so glad about that. Uh, what I want to do right now is just pray a prayer blessing for them, but I don't want to just pray on my own. I want you to pray with me. Uh, and these guys and ladies, they learned a Hebrew word that means uh, to extend your hand that we do in worship. What is the word in Hebrew? Yada. So we're going to yada toward these guys right here, these ladies. And would you pray with me as we do? Heavenly Father, I am so grateful. We are so grateful to look at the faces of these kids and to be reminded that Jesus, when you were here full of God and fully human, 
as you gathered people around you, you would remind us often if we don't come towards you as children, dependent in awe and in wonder, we just cannot see the kingdom. And so I thank you that you have made the kingdom for them. And that now as they have taken this step, as they've learned and they've begun to explore what it means to hear your word as your story, not just words, but your word to them. God, I pray that you would take what they've already learned and you would sink it deep into their hearts, plant it like a seed that grows and that flowers and flourishes. God, I pray that you would always remind them as they read your word that you are a light to their path you're a lamp to their feet. When they go through darkness and insecurity and uncertainty, they can trust and lean on you. And I pray that every one of these kids would grow up with a strong foundation of your words spoken to them, planted into their souls. And we ask that we would see the fruit of that for decades and decades to come. We thank you. Thank you for this church. Thank you for those that made it possible, for the leaders and for the staff and for the volunteers. We are so, so grateful. And so now we give all of it into your capable hands. We trust you, Lord Jesus. And everybody said, amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Good job. All right, well, as they head off to uh, learn some more about Jesus, a couple of things for you. I got announcements in three categories, okay? First category is this rummage sale is coming up in just a few weeks. That's a big St. Andrew's signature event. You bring your stuff, we price it, separate it, sort it, we hold a big sale, and all the money goes to support people outside these walls. It's fantastic, and you can be a part. Go to our website to find out how. Secondly, on Easter, a bunch of things to talk about for Holy Week here. Uh, First of all, we will be baptizing folks at our early service. We have a daybreak service that morning, and we've already had several of you say, hey, I have not yet taken the step of obedience to Christ in baptism. I want to invite you. You can uh, respond. You can go online, and you can let us know you want to do that, and we would love to make that a part of your day as you celebrate Easter, to follow the footsteps of people for 2,000 years, that at daybreak on the day that Christ rose, they went under the waters and pledged their allegiance to him. It's a great thing. Secondly, we're going to have flowers that will be bought by you. If you want to donate in memory of someone you've lost, we have this great opportunity to make our sanctuary look beautiful that morning. Uh, And also, there is one more about Easter to let you know about in your bulletin. There's some tear-off cards. There should be four of them. They're perforated. And here's what I want you to do. Starting today, have a conversation with whoever you came with. If you didn't come with anybody, no big deal, call somebody. And, And you just pray about this and say, who do I need to invite? There are four people in your life that need to hear the good news of Jesus. That because he is resurrected, nothing is the same, and nothing has to be the same in their lives anymore. So would you invite somebody along on Easter? And then finally, last one, last announcement, uh, is right after the service, out in the plaza, there are some churros. If you smell cinnamon and like fried flour dough, like kind of stuff, like that's us. We're, we're out there. You're going to go want to get one. But that is a way to kind of sucker you in to taking a mission trip with us. Uh, you don't have to go on the trip if you eat the churro, but I'm just saying, you know, God's watching. But anyway... If you go out, we've got two opportunities. One is a virtual trip. In about a week, you can jump on and visit Colleen and Chuck Edmonds, our uh, missionaries down in Mexico, or you can go in person. All the info is out there. You can find it and go enjoy a churro as you leave. Now, I'm going to call for the offering, and in just a moment, our is going to come forward, and we're going to continue to worship God. That's what this is, because we believe he's been faithful to us all through our lives, and that won't stop. And so because of his faithfulness to us, we trust him right back. And we open up our lives and we say, God, this is yours. And so that's the way we worship, with our money as well as our words. So do so with joyous and gracious hearts.
invite you to stand and let's sing this together. You take a failure, you take a weakness, you set your treasure in jars of clay. So take this heart, Lord, I'll be your in our life the only word God it seems like our language can't even describe how good your grace is and the only thing that we can say is that it's amazing and so God as we now open up your love letter to us your very word God I pray that we would hear it and it would sink way down into our souls. And whatever we've carried in here, whatever needs healing, God, I thank you as we just say, you take our failures, you take our weakness, and you carry us, God. God, as we listen to your word, may we, in a sense, look deep into your eyes and see your great love for us. And may we respond with love because you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. The women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. 
He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. Hello, everyone. So glad to be with you today. My name is Scott. I'm one of the ministers here. Thanks for all you joining online. We're so glad to have you. As you walked in, hopefully you received a puzzle piece. If you didn't, you can slip your hand up and one of the ushers will come by and give you one. Because we're talking about puzzle pieces today and how they fit into our life. And I hope that by the end of our time here, you will never be able to look at a puzzle or a puzzle piece the same way. Because from here on out, they will remind you of God's faithfulness and our opportunity to respond to God's faithfulness. But before we jump into puzzles, let me remind you of where we've come from. We've been in a series on Ruth, and over the past three weeks, Pastor Jason has talked about Ruth and the implications that her her story has for our lives. And in case you weren't here, let me remind you of what's happened over the last three chapters. So in Ruth chapter 1, we see the story of Naomi begin. And Naomi had a husband and everything was going great except for a famine came into the land. And because of the famine, they had to move to the city called Moab. And so they're in Moab and everything's great. And then they had sons and the sons had wives and Ruth was one of those wives. Then people started dying. It was really bad. It was like, oh my gosh, how are we going to handle this life? And so everything was going bad. Then they're like, oh my gosh, we're starving. How are we going to navigate life? And it was really terrible. So they're like, well, we just got to go back. And so Ruth and Naomi went back to Bethlehem. They're like, well, we got to restart life here because life was going so poorly over in Moab and how are we going to survive? And so they're in Bethlehem trying to figure out what to do. But then they couldn't eat. And it's like, oh my gosh, how are we going to eat? Because you don't have food. And so then Naomi was like, hey Ruth, I know you don't know this Levitical law, but you're allowed because it's harvest season to go behind people and actually pick up the grain from the ground. So like, okay, we'll pick up the grain from the ground. So she goes and she starts picking up grain from the ground so they don't starve to death because that's not a good thing to do. And so as she's doing that, Boaz notices her and Boaz is like, hey! And Boaz is like, oh my gosh, Ruth, come along. And so they start having conversation. And then three months go by in the harvest season. It's like, oh, this relationship's developing. It's kind of blossoming. Everything's fun and great. And then finally Naomi goes over to Ruth and like, hey, harvest season's almost over. You got to make your move because Boaz isn't. And she's like, what do I got to do? She's like, here's what you got to do. There's this old like tradition where you can go in the middle of the night, sit at his feet. And she's like, sit at his feet. That sounds really weird. She's like, yeah, it's bizarre, but it's what we do. Don't ask questions. It's kind of cultural thing. So just do it anyways. So she goes and she's like, wait, before you go, you got to take a shower. You got to put some like perfume on because like it's go time. So she goes and she sits at the feet and Boaz is like, hey, there's something at my feet and it's not my dog. So he goes and he's like, oh my gosh, it's Ruth. Why are you here? And she's like, hello, be my kinsman redeemer. And he's like, oh buddy, if you remember, that's what Jason talked about last week, this idea of kinsman redeemer. That was the closest relative who if like everyone in your family died, the closest relative would then buy your property and get you so that you could have life and you're not starving to death like you would have been a couple months ago. She's like, kinsman redeemer. And he's like, you bet. Except... There's someone else in line. Don't worry, I'll take care of that tomorrow. We'll get all this squared away. Please leave. We'll talk tomorrow. End of chapter three. Okay. Now you're all caught up. So that brings us to chapter four with this big cliffhanger. It's like when season two ends and then like nothing's resolved and then the television studio is like, now you get to wait a year or three till we produce another and you're just waiting. That's what happened at the end of chapter three. But conveniently for you, We just have to turn the page. So we're going to be starting in Ruth chapter 4 to find out what happens next. And that brings us back to our puzzle piece. Um, I'm not much of a puzzle person, but I was recently listening to a comedian who then became a cop. And what he said about puzzles, he was talking to one of his friends. He said, hey, when interacting with me, don't talk very often. Don't lie to me and never touch my puzzle. He was very serious about that. So how many of you guys are puzzle people? Puzzle people? Oh, quite a few. I am not a puzzle person. In fact, I am the person that you puzzle people probably hate because I love to come in and when the puzzle's like 90% of the way done, there's like three spots left and I'm like, hey, I get all the satisfaction, none of the work, but it's great. But when, when you're making, you're like, oh, you're one of those. Yes, shamelessly, I am one of those. When you're making a puzzle, you usually have the box and the box is the picture of what's supposed to be the bigger thing, right? And then what's the first step you do when you start making a puzzle for you puzzle people? The edges. You look for the heart. Any of you guys have an edge piece out there? Any edge piece? I don't know, a couple of you guys? You're like, yeah, we know where to start. Um, Now, when it comes to life, life can oftentimes feel like you're just a piece in God's big puzzle, and we have the world here because, right, you're part of the world, and you have your piece, except for it usually feels like in life like you don't have the box, like you're just trying to figure it out, and there's nothing there, right? And so to have a little fun, uh, I have my own puzzle that represents this, and so I'm going to put a picture on the screen, 
and you're gonna have to try to decide what that is. So, first one is this. What do you think it is? Par audience participation. Guitar strings, okay, okay, that's what Pam was gonna say, okay. Let's see what it actually is. A book, a book, all you readers, you should have known, that's tough. Okay, let's go on to round two. We're getting a little more challenging. Hmm, what is this one? Someone's telephone? I mean, you guys are a little quiet. I'm gonna have to wake you up. I'm gonna start talking faster. <laughs> okay, that's good. Okay, let's see what this one is. A guitar, oh, it's so hard. Okay, I got one more for you. Let's see what this one is. Hmm. What do you think? What do you think? My hand. You think your hand? Okay, that's good. Right. A flame. Let's take a look. Indeed, it is a flame. Ah, they were here last service. Yeah, well, here's, here's the trick. Um, it's really difficult to know what the puzzle is unless you know what you're aiming toward. And that can be what life sometimes feels like. And by sometimes, I kind of mean all the time, where you're like, hey, I know that there's an end goal to this. In theory, we're headed towards something, but it can oftentimes feel like our piece is just one in the midst of a blank canvas that we have no context to of what's going on. And what I love about Ruth chapter four is it gives us both information in the micro with the puzzle piece, but it also expands out for us to see the bigger picture in a way that I think gives us context and a little bit of like a rubric on how we can live our lives today. So much happening in Ruth chapter four. So let's read into it. So if you want to grab your Bibles, you can open them. I'm actually using the Bible that's right in front of you if you want to track along with this. If not, I'll have it on the screen. Words are a little bigger. Uh, we're going to start verse one. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat down there just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along. Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Real quick, some interesting things. This is the guardian redeemer. This is the other person that he told Ruth in chapter 3 of like, hey, here's someone else. The other thing that's interesting, his name's not mentioned. He's just referred to as the guardian redeemer. It's like the Voldemort of people, the name we don't speak. And so he's like, hey, Voldemort, come over here. Okay, let's continue. Verse 2. Boaz took 10 of the elders of the town and said, sit here. And they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative, Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know, for no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he says. <laughs> oh, a lot happened here. We're going to have to break it down. Okay, so here's what's going on. This guy, Voldemort, who should have been the next in line to redeem it, Boaz has an obligation to go to him and says, hey, do you want this? But the author is cluing us in, before we even read the next verse, that something unique is happening here. First of all, if you look at the Hebrew, he's like, hey, come over here. It would be like saying, hey, so-and-so, get over here. Or more specifically, if I was to translate that into modern language, you'd be like, hey, buddy. I think that's kind of what's happening here. So it's like, hmm, something's going on. Okay, so hey, buddy, come over here. He sits down. There's 10 elders of the town who just casually to be in the same place at one time where he's like, hey, why don't you sit down so you can witness the transaction that's about to happen? Now, now when I think of all this setup and what God is beginning to do here, uh, and I think through Boaz's life, there's a theme that, that runs through all of this, and it's this idea that I want to quantify as mundane faithfulness. We see throughout this story that God's name is mentioned very few times, but God's interworkings throughout this story seem to be very clear at various levels. And it really highlights Boaz's mundane faithfulness and Ruth's mundane faithfulness at every level that brings them to this pivotal point. Now, why I call it mundane is because they're not doing these extraordinary acts. They're just responding to God and what God has invited them to do. They're just being faithful to what the law has said. And I thought that was really curious. And so this week I was processing through this idea of mundane faithfulness. But there are a handful of conversations that I had that was like juxtaposing this idea. And how does, how does mundane faithfulness play out into our everyday lives? And so here were some of the conversations that I was having with people that were in the background as I was thinking through this idea. One person I was talking to was trying to process their life after college. 
And what are they going to do? What career are they going to be? They got this degree, and are they actually going to make money in that degree? The next person I was talking to is trying to find a new apartment because they're getting evicted, and they don't know how they're going to live. The next person I was talking to was a brand new mom. hey In case you don't know, I'm a new dad. He's been around for a month now. That's my son, Levi. Look at the little shoes. Yeah, okay. I thank you. I think so. Uh, so I was talking to a new mom and how to navigate life as a new parent. Uh, I was talking to someone else who's trying to figure out how to relaunch his career. He felt like he's getting older and, and he should be at a certain point in life compared to his friends. But, but what's, where is he at in that? There was someone else who I was talking to who was processing uh, his wife who had breast cancer and he was trying to be supportive in that. But that's incredibly heart-wrenching to watch someone you love go through that. I was talking to someone else uh, who's trying to save their marriage. It's on the rocks. And this person was just trying to figure out where is God in the midst of all this. I was talking to a high schooler who's nervous about college and what they're going to do and what college should I go to because that'll impact the rest of my life. I was talking to another person who had lost their job and trying to figure out how to navigate their family. And I'm like, this has been a week. And how does all of this come into play with Ruth and what's happening here? And as I really parsed through that, I thought there's, there's two kind of themes that I'm just observing in these conversations. And it was people were processing through their purpose and they're processing through their pain. And, and I think that's true for maybe 99% of us at one point or, or at, at any given moment, but especially at one point or another in life, of how do we navigate the pain that we encounter in life? How do we navigate our own sense of purpose and calling and what we're supposed to do? And if you look at Ruth in the entire book, there's a couple questions that I think it begs. First of all is, like, like there is pain and suffering in the world, and it makes that statement pretty clear. And if you asked, why is there pain and suffering in the world? Well, you can look at Genesis and see, okay, the fall of humanity, the corruption, sin has distorted every level of creation. And as a result, we encounter pain and suffering on a day-to-day life. But I think you also got to be honest with the text and ask it, well, why is pain and suffering happening to this person at this point? Like, for example, why did God allow the famine to be in the land? Why did God allow Naomi's husband to die, Ruth's husband to die? Because sometimes we just skip over that and we see, oh, God's faithfulness is here. And that's true. But we forget to be honest with the Bible characters that, like, we believe God can intervene. We believe God can do miracles. But oftentimes he doesn't. And so if we're not asking that of the text, I think we're cheapening what's happening here. But I think the author is really direct by saying, you will go through pain and suffering. You're alive. You can bank on it. And that's not an encouraging message to hear. If any right now, you'd be like, what'd you learn? I learned I'm going to suffer. Great Sunday. But a good thing. I got a few minutes left. We'll keep going. But that, that's a common thing that I think the, the author is really trying to get at. But he's also letting you know of uh, the fact that God is weaving something together much bigger than what you might even be able to recognize in this story and in this puzzle. And so all throughout, we see a consistent theme, that God is faithfully aligning things up. And you can have faith that there's just a bunch of coincidences that are happening again and again. Or you can have faith that there is an author behind that intentionally moving pieces together. But we find ourselves at a unique crossroads because you have Boaz's faithfulness and how he's been honorable to God. And you see various examples of that through the first three chapters. You see Ruth's faithfulness and how that collides up until this moment where now you have Voldemort and he has to make a decision on what he's going to do and how he's going to navigate the space in front of him, which, according to the law, would be, hey, be the kinsman redeemer. But I also see something clever happening here with Boaz, where he's faithful, but he's also being shrewd. He's also being really intentional because he knows what he wants, and I think he got more than he gave, and he wanted what he got. Let's continue. I will redeem it, he said. Verse 5. Then Boaz said... On the day you buy the land, by the way, on that day, you will acquire Ruth the Moabite from the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the gardening redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Fascinating turn of events. Now, as a reader, you might gloss over this and say, ah, Boaz gets the girl. Fantastic. We'll talk about that in a second. But let me hold on here. I think it's interesting. Uh, and commentators kind of swim around this saying like, oh, is this guy just being a jerk and didn't want it? Others were like, oh, maybe it really would have put a hardship because the reality of this, if he took Ruth as his, his person and they have his offspring, well, then that entire, the entire inheritance that he had would be split. And so he's now contemplating like his own family and the legacy there and how he's going to process this. And so really, I think I'm seeing in here just a fear-based response to 
well, if I navigate this, if I, if I follow what's in this text, that's going to really be hard for my family. And I thought, oh, how often are we in that scenario where there's something we should be doing, even at our own peril, but out of fear we step back instead of leaning in? And what's interesting, the consequences of that, as we see thousands of years later, are that you're named a Voldemort in a sermon as opposed to having your name written in the text. Now, let, let's break that down a little further because I think this, this continues to drive layers deep. What happens next uh, is absolutely fascinating, and I missed it the first like 40 times I read through this chapter, but then I finally saw it. So if you keep reading the very next verse, it actually starts with a parenthesis, verse 7. It's like this little add that was here, and, I, and I, I glossed over it, but then it's like, well, why is this a parenthesis? Why was this added, and why did the author think this was important? And of course, so let's read it. Now, in the early times of Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the guardian redeemer, those we don't speak of, Voldemort, said to Boaz, buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal. Absolutely fascinating. Why in the world would the author spend precious time telling us about how sandals worked in terms of completing a transaction? And I thought, this is really curious. He could have just said they sealed the deal, but there's something unique in this detail. So I'm like, what's going on here? And then it hit me. Freshman Bible class, APU, Dr. Beloin, it hit me. So when you think of the Old Testament, whenever we see the land in a conversation in the Old Testament, the land is really viewed as like the, the sign of God's promise. You can think of that as a ring when you get married, and the ring is, is a sign representative that I'm within a promise with someone. And so think of that, that's how the land was, that whenever the Israelites were in the land, they were adhering to the promise and being faithful spouses. And whenever they were out of the land, well, that's because they had abused the relationship that had been there, and so there was a temporary removal, but God always had intent of bringing them back to restore the sign of the promise. And so if you look at this like legal transaction that happened, where for us it would be signing a document, for them it's taking a shoe, the idea is, is that when a shoe walks on the land, that's what connects you to your parcel of land. So by giving him the shoe, you're giving him rights to that land. And what's important is this is not just an economic transaction. To have access to the land, to have that, was like having access to God. It was, it was much more than just trying to say, here's your financial security. It was part of the, the deal and negotiation that this represented God's promise of faithfulness, that you could be part of the land, that you could be connected to God. And so what I see here with Boaz is at the risk of his own prosperity, he was willing to say, hey, I, would ex I will exchange what I have and what I think for life to be part of God's process of fulfilling his promise in someone else. Let me explain it another way. If you have the opportunity to give up what you think is success in life, and you have the opportunity to be an agent for God that is fulfilling his promises in someone else's life, that's a fantastic place to be in. Because if you want meaning, if you want purpose, if you want a life well lived, I would much rather be part of God's process of answering promises than my own process of trying to figure out what my own puzzle is in life. Does that make sense? So you have Voldemort, who out of fear says no, and his name is never included. But you have Boaz who says, I'll step up, no matter the cost, because the cost is secondary to what I want. And if I'm being honest, when I look at my own life, I don't want an average life. I don't want to be mediocre. I don't want to just do the thing, live and die. I want there to be meaning. I want there to be purpose. I want there to be success. And you might define success differently than I do, but, but there's that innate sense that I want that for myself. And when I look in the scripture... And I think of like, oh, there's these stories of Moses and like, I want to be one of those characters in the Bible that has like one of these epic adventures. The recipe to that epic adventure isn't to do something epic and step into that in an epic way. I'm seeing the recipe to be mundane faithfulness. That everyday faithfulness responding to God's word produces the type of stories you see in the Bible. And that's wild to me because that's not what culture sends to say. Culture says you have to go there, you have to will it, you have to be conniving and you have to fight for it. And what God is saying is I will be lavishly faithful, you just got to respond. Now you are going to have hardship, pain, and suffering. But your response to faithfulness, especially if it's in process of me giving someone one of my promises, buckle up buddy, you're in for an adventure. 
So when it comes to that and this idea of mundane faithfulness, I like that. That makes sense to me. We've got to be faithful, responding to God. The next question is, well, how do we do that? How, like, what's the recipe that Boaz had, that Ruth had, that ended them to where their names are in the Bible and doesn't end with you like Voldemort where you're forgotten about and have no legacy or meaning or purpose and fear causes you to step away from that. And when I really trace through this, the origins of faithfulness, uh, there's a, the Hebrew, as that breaks down, I was trying to find an English compar- comparable with that. And there's a, an ancient queen who had a phrase that I think really kind of translates well to that that Hebrew, and that is, do the next right thing. Do the next right thing. And I think that's so sticky in terms of this and what's happening here, is that the next right thing is our response to God's faithfulness. Now, you might say, well, the next right thing could be complicated because of what's happening in my life. Sure, break it down further. Continue to break it down. Because if you're truly like battling depression, right, if that's you, you're navigating through, and you have, you're just stuck, and to merely get out of bed is a monster, Simplify, do the next right thing, which might be opening your eyelids. And then the next right thing might be putting your foot out of bed. And then doing the next thing might be stepping up out of bed. And you're like, that sounds trivial. No, 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 it's not trivial. It's the next right thing. That is faithfulness. That is mundane faithfulness that leads to biblical stories. Now, you might be in pain and suffering, and you're just gripped by the fact of like, the next best thing is, the next right thing is hard. It's painful. It's it's not something I can do on my own willpower. Well, let's talk about addiction real quick. If, if, you, if you are a, I'm a very driven personality on the Enneagram. I'm an eight. Are you guys an eight on the Enneagram? Ah, okay, okay, fantastic. All right, so I'll tell you like it is. Uh, and so willpower is something that like, I feel like I could channel and I can just drive something to happen. But if you're really talking about addiction, willpower will fail you nine times out of 10. Like you might get one win, but you ain't getting a lot. And so, yeah, I can preach to you and say, oh, the Holy Spirit will give you power. And I do believe he will. But there's a lot more to it than just the Holy Spirit because you have to do more than just will the next right thing into existence. There's something about the fact of being exposed to God and, and bringing discipline into your life in a way that makes, well, that makes your desires of the flesh weaken so the desires of the Spirit will be strengthened. And to this, I was listening to a Jewish rabbi and he was talking about the Jewish concept of faith. And he said, how we approach it is there's all these rituals that we do. And we do those rituals to help strengthen our faith with the hope that one day, maybe, we might encounter God. And I thought, that's absolutely fascinating. He said, in, in Christianity, we do that. Sometimes we get it lost, though, where the thing and the ritual becomes the end in and of itself. And so I'll remind you that if you have rituals without relationship you're going to result in religion. I'll say it again. Rituals without relationship result in religion. And how you avoid it just being a religious practice is the intentionality behind it. Now, you might say, like, oh, how does this work? Like, you do it every day anyway. It's like, how many of you guys celebrate your anniversary? Yeah, okay. If you're, you've got to raise your hand. If you're, yeah, okay, there you go. How many of you guys celebrate Thanksgiving? Friendsgiving. Your birthday? Great. We do rituals every day in our own lives to help reinforce the relationships that are valuable to us. The same is true with God. So is it a sin to not pray before you eat? No. But what could praying before you eat do? What could reading your Bible consistently do? What could worshiping in your car do? Not for religiosity's sake, but for the sake that you're adding points to the equation of helping you be prepared so that when that addiction is faced and you're with it face to face, you're not just relying on willpower, but you have stored up a whole bunch of exposures to God where you might just be able to hear his spirit guiding you in the moment. I'm reminded of a philosopher. Uh, He said about decisions. He said, whenever you have to make a decision, that's where evil beckons. Whenever you have to make a decision, that's where evil beckons. And I think that's so powerful Because you have an opportunity every day to choose the next right thing or to choose the next wrong thing. And it becomes that simple when it's in front of you. Now, it's more complicated than that, I get. But when you continue to break it down, reduce it, reduce it, it really comes down to what is the next right thing. And what that also gives me freedom to do is to try things and to explore. Because if I'm really trying to to honor God and do do what he's asked me to do, and if it doesn't seem clear, and, but, but I'm trying to go before God, he promises to direct me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. 
In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. That image is not God saying, I'm going to tell you to turn left and then to turn right. That image is when my son gets to be about a year old and he starts walking around, you better believe I'm going to be underneath his elbows walking with him so that he doesn't run into the corner of the coffee table, right? Like I'm going to be guiding him. And that's what God promises to do, that if you're doing your best to put God first, he's going to take care of a bunch of those things in the back end. But it starts not with extraordinary acts of faith. It starts with mundane faithfulness. What has God called me to do? That's why you see so often in the Old Testament, he says, hear and obey, hear and obey, hear and obey. It's because of what he's trying to do in you. And when you live that life, well, it develops purpose. It develops strengths for your weakness. It develops a pattern to help you when you're in times of pain and suffering. Let's continue with Boaz's story. Verse 8. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself. And he removed his sandal and he did the exchange. Uh, And then it it talks about, and I'm going to skip this, uh, how the people received that. And how the people received both Boaz and Naomi's faithfulness. And that's a fascinating read if you want to learn more about, like, how do people encounter your walk with God? Boom, read the second half of four. But I'm going to skip to the end where it goes to the genealogies. You see, as a result of Boaz's faithfulness, he is inserted into a much larger story than he could have possibly imagined. And so it reads through that genealogy, and if you saw him the father of Boaz, Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, Jesse the father of David. Any of you guys heard of King David in the Bible? His act of faithfulness produced a result far bigger than the puzzle would have ever seemed to be. But wait, it doesn't just end there. If you skip forward to Matthew, you see the story gets a little more interesting because there's a genealogy in Matthew. How many of you guys just skip the genealogies in your Bible? Yeah, well, now you're learning they're significant. Okay, let's jump to Matthew chapter 1. Uh, you have the genealogy. It starts with Abraham, the father of Isaac. Skipping forward, you have the first highlight. Judah, the father of Perez, and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. That's fascinating because Judah and Tamar had some crazy scandal that happened between them, but they asked for forgiveness, and now they're inserted into an important genealogy. Skipping through, you have the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Do you remember Rahab? She was the prostitute who helped the spies when they were conquering Jericho. Her act of being willing to be part of God's process put her in this list. Well, then you continue. You have Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Uh, Then it continues. King David, they're on that line. Here's the next line. David, the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Her name? Bathsheba, there's another crazy scandal that happened. And you have these people who, despite their mistakes, were willing to say, God, I'll take what I have and I give it to you. And if you scale down all the way to the end of this genealogy, and I skipped a whole bunch of names, you have Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Mary was the mother of Jesus who's called the Messiah. Boaz's mundane faithfulness, even at his own risk, produced a result that changed the entire world. Ruth's mundane faithfulness that had very much risk produced a result that changed the world. You don't need to live life and expect Moses to happen and you're turning frogs out of the ocean. That might happen, but it also might be you just faithful with the everyday things in life. And it might be that you die before your legacy is realized. Now, Boaz and Ruth, they had a life. They had a son. It was great. They, and then they had their struggles. They continued off because parenting is hard. He never knew the implications of how his decision to be faithful would end up changing the course of history and being in the line of Jesus. But I would, I'd be willing to bet Boaz would certainly take God's plan far before he would take his own plan. There's one last guy I want to tell you about. His name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Have you heard of him? He was a German theologian in the early 20th century, and he came to America twice, and the second time he came was right before the war broke out, World War II. And so his contemporaries said, hey, you should stay here, let the war happen, then you can go restart the church in Germany and, like, be the senior pastor of all of Germany and help them come back. And he said, I have come to the conclusion that I've made a mistake in coming to America. I must live through this difficult period in our national history with the people of Germany. I will have no right to participate in the resurrection of Christian life in Germany after the war if I do not share in the trials of this time with my people. So he went back to Germany right as the war was getting ready to break out. And you know what he did? He was a youth pastor. He went to be a youth pastor. Have you read his book called Discipleship or Cost of Discipleship? 
That was to his seniors in high school who were getting ready to graduate off to become uh, military in the Nazi military, or become officers in the Nazi military. And he was telling them, do not sacrifice your belief in Jesus, your sonship and daughtership to Jesus. Do not sacrifice that for country. Jesus must come first, and it might cost you everything. He then went on to be put in prison, and a few days before he was going to be let out of prison because the war was ending, he was killed. He has no idea, or he would have had no idea, of how his legacy continues to impact people today, where a hundred years later, we're reading all of his books in seminary because of how influential they are. In fact, I hope you outlive your dreams. I I hope your dreams outlive you. If you outlive your dreams, your dreams are too small. Now, here's the hard thing with that. Here's the hard thing, because God's going to come and say, hey, can I have your puzzle piece? Can I have your puzzle piece? And God's going to ask for your puzzle piece. And then God's going to ask for your puzzle piece. And you might say, like, yeah, I'm willing to give God my puzzle piece. And that's great. And then God's going to say, oh, actually, I'm going to put you with this person. And you're going to be like, oh, I don't really like that person. And God's going to mash you together. And then God's going to take some tape. And, God, and you're going to be like, God, this isn't very comfortable. God, why the, why the pain and suffering here? Because this is, this is not what I expected when I came to follow you. Like, I thought I was going to be part of your plan, and I know I don't know all about your plan, but like, I know your plan to save the world and to be gracious. So like, I thought I was going to be part of this, and God's like, nope, I'm going to mash you together with someone else you don't really like, uh, and I'm going to mash you together with a piece of tape. And you're like, oh, tough. And then God's going to say, yep. And then I'm going to place you under the table. And you're like, God, why am I under the table? And he's like, well, my table was a little unsteady, and I needed someone to steady it. And it might not look anything like how you would imagine, but I promise you this. A life servant to God where you're an agent for his purposes, making his promises happen in people's lives, is going to give you far much more meaning, value, purpose than you could ever imagine or manufacture on your own. Amen. So as you go this week, may you go remembering that God's faithfulness is lavish. And you can respond to that with mundane faithfulness. And you respond in mundane faithfulness by doing the next right thing. And what might seriously help you do the next right thing is practicing that over and over again in seemingly mundane ways, like praying for your food before you eat it, or reading your Bible, or coming to church. And those pieces added up might just give you the strength when you're in the dark times to not just be like Voldemort and say out of fear, I can't do this, but to say, God, even if I end up underneath a table, I'd rather be underneath your table than trying to figure out life on my own. I hope that for you. I wish that for you, and I pray that God will continue to inspire your heart as you leave a life, as you lead a life in honor of Him. Let me pray for you. Lord, uh, may your words ring true in us, and may we be able to have the eyes to see and ears to hear where you are working in and through us, so that we may be agents in your kingdom, able to respond uh, to your acts of faithfulness in ways that help us through our struggles, in a way that that truly produces valuable meaning and purpose. Lord, lead us as we do the next right thing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and respond to God's word.
go this week, I want to remind you that out in the plaza, we have some churros talking about our missions trips to Mexico and the things that are there. Also, if it's your first time or you haven't really gotten connected into our community, there's the booth over that's called Starting Point. You can find out how you can get further connected into this church. That might be the next right thing for you to do. Uh, And today as you go, uh, I pray that you will take your puzzle piece and it will be a reminder to you of God's faithfulness and how your response doesn't need to be anything other than obedience to God doing the next right thing. And as you pray before you eat, as you put on a worship song in the car, uh, may that fill you up so that when you're in the times of difficult decision making, you have the strength and the Holy Spirit's power to help you do the next right thing. Go in peace.